Andrew Weisblum is the editor for the French Dispatch of the Liberty Kansas Evening Sun. I'm Matt Noble of Gold Derby here to ask you, Andrew, what was the uh, trickiest thing to edit down in the film? The trickiest thing to edit down? Well, we weren't so concerned with um, compressing things. I mean, things are uh, planned pretty precisely and um, uh, we don't leave a lot of air. <laughs> but there are, there are certain shots that involve a lot of uh, fancy footwork that, you know, hopefully it's not too evident um, at the end of the day, but um, a lot of um, split screen and time manipulation and all that sort of thing. Um, in terms of scenes and stuff, there wasn't anything that really presented challenges in that regard, but there is a lot of frame to frame manipulation and something as simple as the shot of the waiter preparing the drinks in the beginning probably has several dozen cuts and morphs in it and little dissolves and tricks to get it to um, play as quickly as it could possibly play, which was really the gag, I guess. And I guess there's like so much in a Wes Anderson film going on in the shots, like whether it's yes. background or, or foreground, like just a lot's going on. Is it like hard to try to capture that all and not leave things out? Well, it gets, it, it is definitely very dense in terms of the material. You've got visual material and you've got um, music going on and you've got often voiceover that's happening that, may not specifically relate to the picture, but a lot of it is kind of overlapping and transitioning into itself. Um, so a lot of it is kind of, it develops its own um, rhythm and music without being too literal or um, explanatory with it. Um, that's always kind of a challenge to get the right feeling with all that material, which is more gut than um, analysis, I guess. Mm. Uh, I believe this is your fifth Wes Anderson feature that you've worked on. What was different about this one? Well, this one kind of brought together a lot of the different um, <clears throat> techniques and stylistic approaches that had come from all the other films. You've got animation techniques, you've got animatic preparation, you've got um, a lot of different uh, set design things and other post-production production design is what we call it, uh, post-production design that is all this kind of decorative stuff that involves miniatures and all these other things that um, are brought to bear on this. The different stories um, made it unique in that we weren't necessarily approaching it as one piece, but it was three or four films kind of working together side by side. I mean, there is definitely a material that bridges together and bookends the whole thing, but each story in the film or subject in the magazine um, had its own approach and was its own mini movie, um, aesthetically, editorially, and otherwise. Um, but we brought all the different things that we had tried on other films to bear on this one. Yeah, and it, sort of as you say, it's almost this uh, five different films happening here, and even within those five films, it it goes between sort of color to black and white to animation. You, you you're juggling a lot of balls with this one. Um, how do you sort of like sort of keep a consistent language throughout while at the same time um, giving each sort of feature and article within the within the world uh, its own sort of voice and flavor because it's sort of i guess each piece is by a different writer in the film like yes well i mean it it's impossible not to have a certain consistency of flavor with wes as your visionary because wes has a very clear um his clear tastes and aesthetic approaches that kind of permeate no matter what even if he tries to subvert them in the films, whether it's the visualizations or the rhythms and whatever else, you know, however else you want to articulate what it is that makes a Wes Anderson film <clears throat> what it is. But each story kind of has its own subject matter and its own uh, possibly tempo, um, but um, 
I don't think we strive too hard. We didn't have to strive too far hard to keep them consistent with each other um, because they were all coming from Wes's mind and vision. Um, but they automatically had their own differences in terms of aesthetic approach and performances and subject matter and tone um, that made enough of a difference. Dynamic, we, we, I guess. Yeah. We often see um, actors return to Wes Anderson movies. Uh, that probably means on a uh, flip side of the coin, uh, Wes likes working with the same people, but it also means that people who work with Wes like to come back. And that is true, not just in the actor's case, but in yours as editor. What, what brings you back to Wes Anderson projects and what do you enjoy about working on those the most? Well, I'm obviously very proud of the films that we do together. Um, and, you know, they're works of art in my mind. I mean, he, he's, he's fortunate enough and I'm fortunate enough to be working with him on these projects where um, he's able to deliver on his vision and creative vision and um, independence in a way that most other filmmakers have not been able to um, sustain. And, and there are his own stories that aren't um, necessarily dictated by the marketplace in other ways. So he's found his kind of niche to work within a certain budget range, certain style of film with really talented collaborators who enjoy the process. And then um, there are the actors who come back because they feel respected. They feel like it's part of a, you know, a bigger family, I suppose. Okay which is how I feel about it, working on the films. I mean, the, he, Wes is very concerned with creating a, a, a family atmosphere on these films where everybody really gets to know each other and contribute and collaborate and, and feel part of a team. Hmm. And I guess like sort of like, if you could just sort of quickly talk us through, how are you part of that family? How are you part of that team? What is, what is your involvement in a Wes Anderson film look like that might be different to other films you work on? Well, you know, different directors have a different engagement of the process with, with editorial. I mean, some <coughs> will have you do an assembly during the shoot that then they look at and make certain notes on, but they don't, they don't necessarily get their hands dirty. And then there are others, Wes is on the other side of that spectrum. I think it's pretty evident that um, we, I will assemble certain things during the shoot, but we tend to generally cut the pieces together uh, and explore them together. Um, because he has a very clear vision of how he means for it to be cut, meant, he has meant for it to be cut. And, and usually that's spelled out in the animatic and we pick the takes and work on it and pick the vocal performances. And then he'll ask me to kind of contribute my ideas to it once he's gotten his vision on paper, if you will. Um, then we get to play and experiment a little bit. But the other part of the process for me often is that um, because he knows that I understand in a way different than other people who were on the set, um, he'll have me come to the shoot a lot. And I'll, I'll often, in all of our films, I'm usually on location with him uh, so that if something comes up that he's concerned about editorial or editorially, we can talk about it or I can bring something to him if I think there's an alternative that we might need or um, I don't wanna say coverage, but some option inside the way he's planned or blocked it that we see that comes up on the day, some challenge that was unanticipated, um, we're able to spitball about it together. Can you think about like an option you spitballed on the French uh, dispatch or is something in the edit room that maybe you sort of uh, contributed to about sort of how to tell the story? Yeah, I think um, I could think of two things off the bat. There's the there's the scene with Saoirse Ronan where she's talking to the young boy in the in the um, in the closet, I guess. Um, you know, we had we we had been kind of flexible about what was black and white and what was color, and um, that kind of evolved as a process during the shoot as we would look at footage together at the end of the day. Um, trying to figure out what should be black and white and what should be color and was kind of a fluid thing. Um, that whole story, the the whole commissaire story, the Jeffrey Wright sequence, Robert Wright, was originally going to be color. And then we decided mid-shoot that it should be black and white. 
So we were doing it black and white with punctuations of color, but um, the shoot was going fine, but I, I suggested to Wes at one point that maybe um, since they're discussing the color of her eyes, that it made sense to have a punctuation of a shot in color from his point of view through the grill of her revealing her eyes to him. So that was something that just happened on the day. I suggested it to him and, and um, he said, let's, okay, let's keep shooting here and let's set up um, a grill and the other, another camera on the side and pick it up. Um, so Roman Coppola and I just set that up and then she walked over and leaned in, rolled and it was done. Um, you know, fun things like that happen. Another example would be with, um, there's a sequence where uh, Jeffrey Wright is talking to Leo Schreiber on the television interview that's the framework for his piece where he's talking about eating alone. Originally it was kind of an elaborate move that was all done in color um, that ended um, with the story being interrupted and going back to the main story where he's, he's taking this tangent. Um, Wes and I both felt, even though it had a lot of design elements to it and the starry night and this, this whole visual thing that happened, that maybe it would be interesting because he was flashing back to a memory to cut to black and white. So it was an idea that we had while looking at footage after the initial shoot and did it as a pickup. Mm. Oh, that's cool. Did, uh, what, what's something from having worked on five films with Wes that you sort of like um, have learned from him as a filmmaker? Oh boy. Um, I think I've learned, I think we've learned a lot together in terms of um, rhythm and pacing and what, and what you need, and what you don't need is that um, we don't waste time. I guess it's something that I've, I've gotten from Wes is that, um, you know, always trying to find the ways to nibble out little moments and pauses that don't really mean anything. I think as a younger editor, I started out um, being a little more precious about moments in a way that um, Wes is willing to cut deeper on. Um, so I've learned that from him. It's not a ruthless thing. It's just an energy thing um, that he's very consistent and strong about. Do you have a favorite moment from the French Dispatch? Um, well, I, I like so many things in it. There's so many things that are fun and exciting. Um, I'm very happy with the way the first story came together. Um, it's kind of as planned. Um, but probably the most fun section for me to edit was the section with uh, Timothy and uh, Francis because it had the least planning to it. So we were really, it was much more fluid and free form and we kind of experimented with it editorially, found little flourishes of performance. The kind of thing that, um, you know, when you pre-plan to a certain extent, that stuff isn't necessarily um, evident. Yeah. Um, and when you said first story, did you mean the um, the Rose concrete and story? The... Yes, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. And just checking, it wasn't this cycling reporter that you were referring to. No, well, that's to. kind of a it's kind of an interesting yeah. little flourish that whole thing, the, the cycling mm. reporter, which is kind of like a a moose bouche, I suppose. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. The um, I, I think just something that's great about Wes Anderson films in general, but particularly this one, is the nice little reactions that different characters have to different things that happen, and sort of um, uh, it must be a sort of like in some ways tricky thing to sort of make sure you capture all of them quite well, and like make sure they, you know, how long do you stay on the beats of those reaction shots? Yeah, you play around with that a lot. I mean, that's a that's that's a pretty pretty uh, persnickety timing thing that we play around with. We often start with the timing that we anticipated with the animatic, but it always changes because the performances bring something unique and different to it that we want to keep our eyes and instincts open towards. Yeah. What's your favorite Wes Anderson film? I don't have one. You can't <laughs> say that. <laughs> they're all, I mean, they're, I've, I've poured my blood, sweat and tears into all the ones I've yeah. worked on. I don't know. I don't know that I can, um, you know, I guess I'll always hold a special place in my heart for the Darjeeling Limited mm. because it's the film we got to know each other on. 
and got to work on together. And, and it was such a special, unique experience for me and a leap forward for me um, that, um, you know, that that's a very formative moment. Yeah. For my is career, it, at least. Yeah. From any any of the films of his that you've worked on, is there a particular moment that you're particularly fond of or that just like you keep on sort of going back to in your head that was special? Well, we're always referencing our other films. When we're working yeah. on something, we always say, well, this moment is like that moment in this film or this moment is like yeah. that moment. I'm working on a moment right now on his newer film um, that he just finished shooting where uh, I started, we were trying to figure out how to do something and I just pulled up some stills from Isle of Dogs and I said, what if we do one of these? And I was like, yep, yeah, one of those. And then we, and then it's kind of a, it's one of the beautiful things about being able to work on so many films over these years with him is that we develop shorthand like that, where there's not a lot of um, trial and error. You know, we, yeah. we, we get there pretty quickly. Oh, that's nice. Um, we're also an awards uh, website at Gold Derby. We love following the awards and, and, and covering them in a film that had a very different uh, tone uh, than the Wes Anderson uh, world of films was Black Swan, which you got an Oscar nomination for. Uh, did. What did that uh, recognition from the Academy mean to you? Um, and and what, what are you particularly sort of, um, what was particularly precious about that sort of experience of editing that? Well, it's very, it was a very exciting time. Um, and it was exciting for that film to be received <clears throat> the way it was. I mean, you know, it's over a decade now, but um, it changed a lot for me in terms of um, people having confidence in my abilities and um, understanding how things work and understanding, I guess, honestly, that you never actually know what's going to connect with an audience or how it's going to connect or resonate with an audience. You really just have no idea. I, if you asked us at the time that if, if that film was going to break through the way it did, I don't think any of us had any idea. Um, and I think that's always true. I mean, you, we know when we like something or we don't like something, it doesn't mean it's going to connect with an audience. And obviously, you know, sometimes you hit a zeitgeist like that and you just run with it, which is very exciting. Mm. And obviously uh, it's exciting to be recognized by your peers and I got into the academy off of that and that's been a great thing for me to to have um, other other colleagues and familiarity with them and I've gotten to know them over time so that's mm. been great yeah and you've been quite busy the the past sort of uh, year or a bit because it's not just uh, French Dispatch but also Tick Tick Boom and the eyes of Tammy Faye you also edited which are part of this yeah. Oscar season and Derby. So uh, what's it like sort of going between projects that are, they are all so vastly different in terms of the tone of the world to those films? Well, you know, from, from where I sit, that represents over two years because yeah. if not three years, because there was the pandemic that the delayed, not just the release of um, Tick, Tick, Boom, but also um uh, French Dispatch was yeah. originally supposed to be at Cannes in 2020. Mm. I finished it at the very beginning of 2020. Um, so, you know, when I sit here and we talk about the film, it's an experience from almost two years ago, pre-pandemic and everything. So um, that's a bit strange. Um, obviously, the films don't relate a lot to each other stylistically. No. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think that's something that I kind of strive for which is I'm, I'm fortunate enough to work with two filmmakers who are independent and unique and they have their own kinds of films but I work to not get pigeonholed in terms of the other kinds of projects I I involve myself with and often they're I look for things that are specifically not related to what I do with Wes or what I do with Darren yeah that like sort of uh, so many different like you Tick, tick, boom, a musical. You've done with Wes in the past, stop motion animation. You've, yep. you've got a very sort of uh, very sort of catalog of, of always of looking to flex different muscles and find what I enjoy yeah. and what I don't enjoy. I mean, it, it's that way you don't end up in certain ruts and relying on older approaches. Hmm. You talked about um, how um, 
um, you know, um, things that resonate uh, with audiences aren't always what resonates with the filmmakers or, or particular individuals. Mm -hmm. um, just to wrap up, I was wondering what from when you look back on that experience of working on the French Dispatch and that film, uh, what resonated the most with you about that experience and that, that film? Uh, it's hard, it's hard to say. I mean, I think just the, the, um, aesthetic of it all is so, um, overwhelming and impressive and, um, just pushing, pushing that kind of post manipulation of material in a way that, um, we normally don't with other filmmakers that Wes and I kind of keep pushing the envelope in terms of what's possible with the footage and with the material. Um, I mean, I think for me, that's that's an excitement that we both get out of it by being able to twist and turn the footage in a way that people don't realize. Mm. And what what you sort of end up with is a is a magazine as a film or a publication sort of a, in in the format of a film, which is really fun. Yeah, and we don't even necessarily intellectualize too much of it, or, mm. uh, but we mm. kind of sort of realize that some of the references in terms of how it comes together are based on magazines like all the kind of split screen experimentation that we did in the film was kind of we sort of realized somewhere along the way that it was a bit based on our subconscious understanding of magazine layouts mm. you know which we yeah. didn't really <laughs> articulate until later um yeah. but it, it and same with the way we played with subtitles and how they were laid out mm. graphically in a way that um you know, it's not is more of a uh, magazine trope than a than a film I, filmic idea. Yeah. Oh well, Andrew, thanks so much for chatting with us today. People can sure. um, go to goldderby.com to watch other interviews of award contenders and join the discussions in our forums. And Andrew, all the best of luck with the upcoming uh, Oscars and other award nominations down the pipeline. Thank you very much for having me.